Okay. All right. I know. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. Daniel Kelly. This is the Black History Month Fireside Chat with uh, Mr. Henry Hunter from the Pioneer Baseball League. Uh, we really ex are excited about this opportunity for Black History Month and for more importantly, to bring um, a leadership spotlight to someone I've known for many years, but, but more importantly, someone who has had a, a career path that is a game changer and something that's gonna be a really good value add for not only our program, but for an understanding of the resolve and resiliency it takes to find success in, um, in, in the career in baseball, but more importantly in the sports industry. Um, Henry, thank you for joining us. This is an exciting opportunity for the students to meet you, but more importantly, to get a chance to, to understand your story. And especially as we, as we celebrate Black History Month and, and this fireside chat spotlight on you. Awesome, well, happy to be here. Uh, a theme you're gonna hear tonight is relationships. And I've thoroughly enjoyed my relationship with Dr. Kelly. Uh, I was at Georgetown when he arrived and he quickly leapfrogged me into a senior senior member of the faculty administration there, but we stayed real close. And so anytime you ask me for anything, I'm happy to be here. Uh, hopefully you guys will gain something from this. Uh, I was joking with him that I've never been referred to as part of black history, but it's an honor. Um, <laughs> and I'm more than happy to share whatever you wisdom. So please interrupt me with questions. I wish we could see all four of you guys, but, um, yeah, uh, open book. So let's get into it. All right, perfect. Okay, so um, for Henry's background, as the executive vice president, Henry Hunter leads the Pioneer Baseball League's legal operations, licensing, uh, media, umpires, managers, and on-field rules enforcement. Um, he previously served as director of business and legal affairs with the Washington Nationals um, during the major league uh, franchise's return to the nation's capital. In that role, he helped negotiate complex commercial agreements with sponsors, suite holders, vendors, broadcasters, and licensees. He also assisted with the construction, zoning, and tax issues as the club relocated from RFK Stadium to Nationals Park in partnership with the District of Columbia Sports Entertainment Commission. In addition to his baseball experience, um, Henry Hunter has a diverse legal and political strategies background, having served as a trusted advisor to multinational corporations, political campaigns, advocacy groups, foreign governments, and entrepreneurs. Um, he's the founding principal of Myers Parks Projects, a consultancy that empowers entrepreneurs to scale their reach, opportunities, and impact through legal counsel and business strategies that leverage coalitions and relationships to multiply client networks. All right, Henry, this is this is great. And this is what we do at the NYU Tisch Institute. Um, we're looking to, to hear your story. We're looking, and of course, to, to understand how you got to where you are right now. And so my first question is, please explain your approach to your role, especially how multifaceted it is mm -hmm. as the EBP for the Pioneer Baseball League. Cool. Um so just for context, the Pioneer League was affiliated with Major League Baseball until late 2020. Um, really, until, I'm sorry, late 2019. And then there was no 2020 season. So I start early 2021, which is with what is effectively a 100-year-old startup. Yeah. So we had been affiliated with Major League Baseball at a time where all you had to do really was meet the guy at the airport, find him an apartment, and you know take orders on the pitch count. You know, wins and losses didn't matter. You're basically selling hot dogs while taking orders from the big league club. Now, all of a sudden, our clubs had their uh, player salaries on their books. So that's another $300,000 a year each club had to find. Mm -hmm. They lost their affiliation, so they had to figure out their entire uh, league from the bottom up. So when I came in, we had no league rules. We had no league contracts. We had no player contracts. You know, it was all from scratch, and I love that because it gave me the freedom to imagine whatever I wanted it to be and make it that. Um, and I think that having worked at a large law firm where you know, you're know you the junior associate who reports to the senior associate who reports to the junior partner who reports, you, know, you might not ever see where your work goes. You might not ever understand the big picture context of why you've been asked to do something. Whereas here, you know, we didn't have internet. I mean, we didn't have email addresses, you know what I mean? So it was fun for me to do a lot of things that you wouldn't consider legal or executive vice president level task, but it helped me not only understand, but build every piece of an organization. And I think that 
the more indistinguishable you are, the more value you're adding. So it, it's, you know, obviously selling and bringing in revenue is the best way to add value to any organization. Uh, but, you know, just the infrastructure of an organization, if you get your hands dirty and you're willing to say that no task is above or below you, you know what I mean? So I was doing stuff that I didn't think I was qualified for. And I was doing stuff that I thought I was way overqualified for. And, and you kind of have to do it all with an open mind and a, and a, a spirit of uh, enthusiasm. I mean, I, I think you'll learn quickly that if you don't really want to be there in sports, you won't last there long. Because, mm -hmm. you know, I was making $15 an hour for the Washington Nationals. And every single day, a letter came in from somebody twice as experienced me uh, offering to do the job for free. You know what I mean? So it was like... Like, you know, I mean, there's only so many, whether 30 in, uh, MLB, whatever, whatever, you probably had 150 pro sports organizations in the big four leagues, roughly, maybe 120, 125, right? So you got to be flexible. You, you know, that's not just in terms of your role, that's in terms of your geography, in terms of your sport. I play basketball my whole life. Uh, I would argue my second favorite sport is probably football. And you go down the list, my third favorite is probably soccer. You know what I mean? But you know, working in pro baseball is a lot closer to what I always wanted to do than, you know, being a, a you know, construction lawyer or whatever. You know what I mean? So um, I would just say you got to do it with an enthusiastic spirit. You got to be extremely flexible. Um, it, you know, it's almost the same approach to playing any team sport. Like sometimes you're the freshman, sometimes you're the senior. Mm -hmm. and, and if you're bringing toxic energy, you know, you'll, you won't last long. All right. As a follow up to that first question about the Pioneer Baseball League, you you mentioned you called it a, a 100 year startup, mm -hmm. uh, knowing that you were coming into a minor league baseball system that has the longevity. It's been around since what 1876. Right. It's been around for a very long time. So or 1892, but the 1800s nonetheless. And so um what value add does that bring knowing that it has the, the, the history, it just doesn't have the system for success. Right. Well, that, and that's the beauty of it. Cause you know, and especially in our league, like on the one hand, we're in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. Idaho, Utah, Colorado, Montana. On the other hand, we're pretty much the only pro sports from the Denver Broncos and Colorado Rockies to the Seattle Mariners. Yeah. Right? And so in, in Billings, Montana, for example, you know, we've got 50 year multi generation fans. You know, yeah. we've got host families that hosted now big leaders. And, you know, Jazz Chisholm stayed with a family in Missoula that's in our league, et cetera, et cetera. And so, you know, the history is there. I like, I live in Miami, fair weather fan. You know, if, if the Heat are under 500 on an 85 degree day, forget it. <laughs> you know what I mean? But here it was like, this is the only game in town. This is literally yeah. the largest gathering spot in all of these towns. And so for us, it was this pressure of how do we, how do we take an entrepreneurial approach to our new reality while still selling $7 tickets to the people that are fifth generation season ticket holders? Yeah. You know I mean? how, do, how do we take, you know, there's some purists who said, look, between the innings, if you're not selling peanuts, we don't hear your voice. You know, how do we turn that into a digital ad for a potential, um, you know, fan engagement sweepstakes or a lottery or, or you know, hopefully we'll be betting soon. You know what I mean? So it was kind of this fun contrast between the old and the new. Yeah. And, and my role was the new. And, I, I you know, I, I, I've lived in Miami, Atlanta, D.C., and Tallahassee. So I'm coming from a long way away from these folks. Obviously, I look a lot different. Our average fan was a 72-year-old straight white male. And they're like, dude, we need international fans. We need, you know, LGBTQ fans. We need Black people. We need... That we need that guy's basically his his you know twenty five year old granddaughter. We need to make her a baseball fan if we're going to survive as a company. You know what I mean? And so it was really fun for me to say, you know, this isn't an imposter role. You know, they're they're buying my imposter syndrome, if you will. They want me to think like like the dude who won a Yahoo Fantasy League when I'm building our team out. You know what I mean? They want me to think like the guy that played college basketball and I'm trying to figure out how to improve, improve the pace of play in baseball. You know what I mean? Yeah. So. So it's fun for me because it's like, I appreciate baseball, but I'm not a purist. And so it was, so I got to directly attack the things I thought were wrong with the game, if you will. All right. I want to build on that point. I feel like that, that point is very important because if you were a purist, if you were a fan per se, you might overlook 
the, the business side of it because it you might assume it's organic where for you you're looking for it it's not there and you're looking for at it from a business standpoint so explain that point about being about not being a purist and how it benefited you so i'll tell you a funny story um the night before i interviewed for the job i ultimately got with the washington nationals yeah it's a target and i bought mlb the show 2006 and i stayed up till 3 a.m playing with the nationals and I could have told you anything you wanted to know about Ryan Zimmerman, Alfonso Soriano, all those guys. I walk into the interview and he's like, what do you know about licensing agreements? <laughs> what do you know about marketing deals? What do you know about a naming rights agreement? We're trying to get naming rights to the stadium. He asked me 50 questions and not one of them had to do with anything that ever happened between the lines on the field. Mm -hmm. and, and the reality is that sports law is business law. You know, I was doing construction law. I was doing trademark law. You know, even from a business perspective, I was doing marketing stuff and, you know, how to deal with the city government and the politics of it. None of it had to do with me being a fan. And and my boss at the time would have told you that's a good thing. I think there's a balance because I've got a staff now of people and the ones that only love the job and not the game aren't going to go the extra mile. Like I've got a kid who literally writes a blog about the Mets in his spare time and he watches our games and becomes fans of the players and you know could tell me stuff he saw on instagram about so and so get engagement and, and like he's living and breathing it and and i see a value out in that too while also saying to him look we gotta we gotta drive this revenue regardless of we don't you know we don't care who wins or loses you know the, what my boss always says the president of our league is that if you go to a minor league game you want to ask a family four questions on the way up did you enjoy yourselves yeah. will you come back Will you tell your family and friends to come back? And oh, by the way, who won the game? And every time we do that, 50% know the answer to question four. And we don't even care because it's a, it's a street festival. It's a series of restaurants. It's an entertainment Then you wrapped around a sporting event. Yeah. And would I love that sporting event to be LeBron James and Andy Davis? Obviously. But finding ways to drive revenue when, you know, it is smaller dollars. You know what I mean? Like we're not dealing with Nike, we're dealing with New Era, the you know, subsidiary, you know what I mean? And so it's fun to, you know, I, I, we're perfectly irrelevant is what I tell people. You know, it's it's major, it's professional baseball, we have an MLB relationship, but it's minor enough that we can try stuff. And if it doesn't work, try something else. Try something else, yeah. Okay, I do have more questions, but I do wanna make sure that um, if anybody attending this session would like to, add questions into the queue. We do have a Q&A feature. And so please remember, it'll send me an alert once you add your question, but I do wanna make sure this session is as interactive as possible. And so for my next question, um, Henry, you, you spoke briefly about your experience with the Washington Nationals and how that kind of gave you an understanding of the business side, the legal side of professional baseball. Um, you've worked in various capacities for the Nationals, different roles, et cetera. Um, how did that prepare you to take on this kind of leadership? Because as you mentioned earlier, you have to be creative. You can't look at it from the same lens as we have a star player, but you did mention some of the creativity around how you will do the fan engagement. Can you take us deeper into that story? So the Nationals similarly, I mean, we moved from Montreal, and the first year we were owned by Major League Baseball, which is as bland as you can get. We were in RFK Stadium, which it's I would terrible. argue it's terrible. Has more rats per capita than yeah. other square block on you in, in America. Um, so, you know, baseball hadn't been in DC in what fifty plus years or so. So we yeah. got we had a blank slate. You know, one of the first things I worked on was whether or not that curly W was a Walgreens trademark infringement. You know what I mean? And and we had no legal department. So me and the vice president of business affairs were the two lawyers in the, in the shop and we figured that part out, but it was real fun because we, you know, which radio station do we do a deal with? You know, obviously you might've read about the Masson deal we did, uh, the, the Mid-Atlantic Sports Network. Um, you know, it was, it was how, do we, how do we attack the community? You know, we had a really interesting fight there. I'll give you another one. And this is where you kind of get the point of representation matters. You know, we were in DC. Um, and their whole approach to diversifying the fan base was to go to the poorest schools in town and give away tickets. Mm -hmm. And so I sent them this report and said, look, man, like this is the wealthiest concentration of African-Americans outside of Africa. Like, look at what the average black fan spends on Redskin tickets. 
Look what average black fan spends on wizard tickets, even capital tickets. I was like, don't give this shit away. Charge them exactly what you charge everybody else, if not more, and watch them fill up the front rows. You know what I mean? And and so it was kind of like that. You know, you, how do you say that delicately? Because I was I was an intern. You know what I mean? If I, if I phrased that the wrong way or or approached the you know senior ownership with it, boom! But are you calling me racist? Get out of here. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, but how do you articulate it in a way that is in their language? And to me, it's all about the bottom line. You know, like having dealt with you know, elected officials and prime ministers and CEOs, everybody can see right through all of the fluff and answer the single question, are you adding value? Are you adding tangible value? Not, does it make me feel good to be around you? Not, are you throwing me ideas that would be awesome one day, but like, are you moving the needle now? And, and so that's always the approach, you know, I'll have a big win at work and I'll walk around here like, like my shit done stink. And, and my wife would be like, yo, you know, it's just like baseball. Tomorrow morning, you can walk up to the plate, oh, bro. You know what I mean? And, and that pitch is coming 95 miles an hour, whether you hit it yesterday or not. So you don't have time to be sitting around saying, I hit three home runs yesterday. You got to go and do it again today. And, and I think baseball more than any other sport will teach you that you got to be consistent. You got to show up. You got to be able to move the needle on a daily basis and, and not rest on your laurels. So, I don't know if I answered your question, but oh no, no, that, that, that that's great because it kind of leads into, into my next question. Because you know, with your with the Pioneer Baseball League, I mean, essentially, you have to have that mentality. You have to have the today's a new day mentality. Um, how did you keep from burning out during the pandemic? Because obviously you have been in this role for since the pandemic, the reorganization of MILB, a lot has happened. And um, that that mentality, the pandemic was tough. So how, how did you maintain during that time period? I mean, I, I, so candidly, uh, I was the opposite of burned out at the end of the pandemic. I was starving. I was hungry as hell because mm -hmm. I, my career in politics ended abruptly when all of the people who bet on Hillary Clinton woke up to John Trump, and all of a sudden the market for liberal lobbyists was soon. You know what I mean, so I found myself somewhere between self-employed and unemployed from 2017 until 2020. I started my own consulting firm. You know, I did all kinds of, I would call it random, but everything leads to somewhere. You know, they're all building blocks. But when I, so I got an opportunity with Nationals in 06 that kind of fell in my lap real easy. And you start thinking this is the way the sports games work. Like I'm the chosen one, blah, 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 blah. 2008 rolls around. I don't get a permanent position. I go into politics. The politics stuff ends abruptly. And I realize it's been 10 years since I had a full time job in sports. So I interviewed with Baltimore Orioles, I interviewed with the Miami Heat. Um, none of that came to fruition. So when this came, I woke up every day with a sense of urgency. Like it wasn't burnout. It was, you know, how can I do all the stuff I wish I've been doing for the next 10 years today? You know what I mean? And so it was really fun to get involved and like, you know, I had, I had a lot of sleepless nights where I was designing our transaction system. I literally was going off Yahoo Fantasy Football and having a blast because I appreciated the fact that jobs in pro sports can be fleeting. I mean, you're an ownership of change away from somebody giving their nephew your job, no matter who that guy is and who you are. You know what I mean? So when I hit the ground running, it was, especially since I've been working from home, it was like, let's go. Like, you know what I mean? Like, like, you know, we'll think about burnout later. And the answer to your question is you hire really good people who you can trust. Yeah. And you design systems that can be taught and improved upon. Yeah. But, but you also have to be, I think if you're hungry, you don't burn out. And, and, and you know, boundaries are important too. I think having a young child gave me a really convenient non-negotiable. Like, you know what I mean? Like from, from six to eight, I'm reading Dr. Seuss and serving chicken nuggets, no matter what's going on in the week. And, and I think being able to draw that line and, and say, you know, a team owner calls me, I'm with my son. If you don't respect that, kiss my butt. You know what I mean? I don't say it in those words, but it's kind of like, but you know what I mean? I'll, I might stay up all night working after bedtime, but you've got to stand up for yourself. If I, Cause there, even this week, I was in Columbia for my 10th wedding anniversary. As soon as I put that Colombian SIM card in my cell phone, I got texts from all these people who had seen my out of office email. Like, well, I'm just gonna text him my question, even though I know he's out of the country. And I sat there and told my wife, like, look, like there's a 10 second answer to this question and I'm not gonna give it to him until next Wednesday when I'm home. Because I need these people to understand that when I tell you I'm with my wife and a kid, I'm with my wife and a kid, <laughs> you know what I mean? 
And, and so I think boundaries and quality staff are the answer to, to, to burnout. But again, when you spend a decade looking for your next opportunity and, it, and you get it, a lot of people don't have, you don't, you don't have to, you don't have to tell them twice to make the most of it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Okay. So. And then um, I do have a follow up to that question about the operational side. So let's say when you're on the clock, knowing that you are possibly a two hour, three hour difference from the games, the, the, uh, the operations that are happening on ground um, with you being located on the East Coast, um, how, how are you managing that? Especially because as you mentioned, six to eight is your time, but six to eight does cut into the preparation time for them. Okay, all right. And that's four to six. Everybody has four got a five mind. It's hitting me as I'm putting those chicken nuggets in the oven, saying I got an hour to get this answer. But for me, I have so many constituencies that like I'll do an average of five, six Zooms a day. And, you know, I'm getting 30 calls a day from the assistant general manager about a visa all the way to the manager about, you know, whether or not there are towels in the locker room. Right. And so the time difference has been an absolute blessing. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't usually get a call before 8 or 9 a.m. Mountain Time, which is 10 or 11 a.m. Eastern. So I dropped my kid off at 8, 39 o'clock, and I got two hours to do what I call macro work. You know what I mean? The things, the, the flow state stuff that you need on and on. You know, I, I can't write a contract if my phone's ringing every five minutes. You know what I mean? I can't negotiate a deal or think through our strategy. If, you know, so I take those first two hours where the sun's not up on the mountain uh, time zone. And that's my macro time. That's where I actually do my job as opposed to talking about my job all day. Um, yeah. so for me, it's a blessing. Um, do I end up late? I mean, our games in sometimes 1, 2 a.m. Eastern. That's correct, yeah. And, and you know, often I'll get a call from somebody. If it's not an umpire, it's a manager or a GM after the game saying X, Y, Z, you know, blah, 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 I'm, I'm on set or blah, blah, blah. You know what I mean? So, but... Again, nobody calling to me 11 a.m. the next day. So I think we all learned during the pandemic that when you're working from home, you know, I need five to six hours of sleep and it doesn't really matter whether it's from three to eight or 12 to five, you know what I mean? So I just kind of move it around. Um, I would tell you it was really important to have a flexible and unselfish partner. Um, you know what I mean? And, and you know, that's a general life advice, whether it's sports or not. But um but no, I think the, the time difference has been almost a blessing and not a burden for me. Okay. Um, my, my next question has to do with um, the operations of your league. You know, if you were under the umbrella of MLB, you would have the restrictions and also the support of the MLB. So um, we can kind of call it the gift and the curse, um, the gift of freedom, but also the curse of you don't have the the safety net of the MLB. Um, how do you navigate knowing that you do have this autonomy, but in essence, you don't have the bailout? Of right. yeah. So for context, um, I'm thinking before I share, accidentally share anything that's too confidential. We are in year, coming up on year three of a three-year arrangement as an MLB partner league. At the end of these three years, namely this upcoming October, the folks in New York MLB are gonna decide whether to leave the minor league baseball system where it is, which is 25% smaller than where it used to be when they contract, right. whether to contract further or whether to go in the other direction and reaffiliate more clubs. Now, you know anything about pro sports, the honchos at the top will rarely admit they were wrong. They'll drive it to a ditch before admitting they ran off the road. <laughs> you know what I mean? So you can bet MLB not going backwards on the affiliation situation. In our league, there's a debate between whether we were relegated or liberated. You know, and half the owners say, look, losing affiliation gutted the value of my club. Um, I'm going to do everything I can to kiss MLB's butt and get back in good graces. Of course. Another half the owners that say, we're free. Let's do a TV show. Let's do our own streaming deal. Let's renegotiate all of our own licensing. Let's get rid of extra innings and have a home run derby that we can't call home run derby because of the trademarks, but we call it a knockout round at the end of the tie game. And so, like, you know, we said, look, you know, the 11th inning, at a minor league game where you're, it's already last call, you're not selling more beer, that family of four has been gone because it's bedtime. <laughs> you know what I mean? You're, the pitcher's arm is being burned out. Fly balls are five dollars a pop going over the fence. Like there's no upside to playing extra innings in minor league baseball. So without having to ask anybody permission, 
we said, let's let's make up a home run derby. It became really cool. It was a viral thing. MLB ended up copying the idea for the All-Star game the next year. Uh, but it gave us, you know, it's how do you distinguish yourself? And that's the challenge I love. Because if somebody wants to watch quality baseball, you're watching the Yankees, you're watching the Mets, you're watching the Astros, you're not watching the Missoula Paddleheads. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so what do we do to be relevant? You, you know, we don't want to be the stand of bananas and change the entire game to a point where we have to be a, basically the Harlem Globetrotters. But we also don't want to be just a really poor man's version of the Mets. You know what I mean? Uh, so it's been fun to figure out. Yeah, you know, and like I got a text today from one of our DMs that said, Do you mind if I put GoPros on the umpires' hats? And I'm like, by Tuesday, that might be a league wide mandate. <laughs> you, know, you know how long it would take? Yeah, MLB years. Yeah, years. When the family had to vote on it. <laughs> like, yeah, you know, exactly. yeah. So so it's been it's been really fun for me because we like I made up a TV show in the middle of the night watching Peyton and Eli. And it came to fruition in three months. Hmm. So I love it. I love I love not having a lot of masters, if you will. Like we don't have a player association. You know what I mean? Like almost everything in the league comes to us. It's like if Roger Goodell owned the NFL network. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So. yeah, it's like like essentially you, you're not negotiating with the with the umpires union, with the with uh with the players union, but of course the, all the different constituencies that would slow down the process of your creativity. Right. So it allows for you to be more more direct. And so my my next question is to do with with students. And so students who all they know is the traditional baseball route, the traditional professional baseball route, excuse me. And so what, what you are explaining is that you have seen both sides. And so for, for a student who possibly didn't know that, that the minor league system offers this kind of creativity and flexibility where they can actually grow and learn the business of professional baseball, how, how would you advise them to, if they were to explore this avenue? Um, I, I think that might be, a, so for me, it's, it, it depends on your personality type. If you know that you want to do sales and that's all you want to do is ticket and sweet sales and you want to do it at the highest level, you get in at the bottom of a major league organization and you go get those big commissions on the big deals and you become a salesperson. For me, it was always about maximizing the options to do different things. And that's the sweet spot of minor league baseball because I'm getting all of this experience that I would have never got as a junior lawyer for a big league club. Like yeah. if the lawyer walks in and says, I have a new merchandise, I, I designed these shirts. Get the hell out of here. You're a lawyer. You know what I mean? Oh, I got an idea for a TV show. Boom. So, so I would say if you want a broad range of experiences, you know, the, I mean, we're a seven, six person league office. There are probably 600 people that work on Park Avenue at MLB. Yeah. So the smaller the office, the more responsibilities you have. Um, you have to be flexible. Almost the vast majority of minor league baseball are, is, you know, by definition, not in major league cities. You know I mean, I, I love a good metropolis. And, and the beauty of this moment is that the entire kind of work, you know, the sociology of work changed during the pandemic. It's not weird to anybody that I'm sitting in Miami. It's an 85 degree day. And it was negative one in Wyoming today where we're trying to install a ball tracking system. They're like, dude. There's like four feet of ice on the ballpark. What are you talking about? <laughs> and I'm like, uh, I just got done swimming. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, so I think that you guys have the beauty of the Zoom situation where you can be anywhere. Yeah. And and that you know we have remote internships available where you don't have to see Miami, Montana, or anywhere in between. You know, we've got interns at Syracuse that never leave upstate New York, and so you can take advantage of that. You know, it's the same thing with the network. I always tell people, like, we used to have to go stand around me and, and Dr. Kelly and be awkward, have our business cards in our pocket. Y'all can lay in bed in your underwear and go through LinkedIn and build an amazing contact list or reach out to people directly. Like, that's fundamentally different than, you know what I mean? Waiting until you're there to rent, trying to sneak in the side door, invite yourself, make up something to say. Like, take advantage of this new reality, guys. Like, like I always say, every, you know, Rahm Emanuel used to say in the, in the Obama White House that every crisis is an opportunity. Yeah. yeah. For me, yeah. for me, it was almost like the traditional economy had kind of run its course in my world. And so when everything got shook up, I was like, oh, like, how do you, how do you indulge this disruption? Yeah. Now, I would say, though, that expertise is always valuable. So, 
even at the minor league level, if you're the guy that understands trademark or you're the girl that's an expert in visas or you're, you know, the person that has dug in really deeply on pitch clocks and ball tracking and analytic data, like there will be a role for you and your expertise. Um, but I mean, you know, the answer to everything is networking relationships. So that's how you get, that's how you get in anyway. Okay. Um, I, I, I do want to, you, you kind of, you brought up briefly about your, your, your experience in, in DC politics and um, in Washington, DC, US politics. Um, you spent over 10 years in politics, um, good and bad of how it impacted your approach to leadership and business. I with the bad. I think the so politics, especially DC politics, you can get sucked into this really superficial game. What I like networking versus relationships. Like I don't know, like if you heard, you know, Yoel heard. We jumped on earlier. My first question for Daniel, Dr. Kelly, sorry, is how's your son? Because that's my boy in a legit way. Whether he can hook me up or not, and I think that the lobbying and politics will teach you a lot about fake relationships. I mean, I had. I'd say a third of the people that call me every day stop calling when I can no longer do anything for them. And I was like, it's liberating. I was like, these are exhaustingly fake relationships. You know what I mean? People who genuinely cared about me were like, how can I help you figure out what's next? You know what I mean? And so yeah, I think that distinction helped me a lot when I got to baseball and it was kind of like, you know, you're the new guy, whatever. And I took the time to get to know all these people. And, and it's, not, you know, it's not even a matter of whether they think I'm smart. It's a matter of whether they think I'm a decent, reasonable, good person. And like, building those real relationships are critical and i and you know politics will you know you look at somebody's business card before you decide whether or not to talk to them or how to talk to them baseball is kind of like everybody is equal until you get on the field and then some people separate themselves you know what i mean so it was really good for me to have had that that epiphany from the fake to the real relationships yeah for getting into a smaller more intimate setting you know what i mean because as you can imagine the uh personalities in Montana are a lot different than personalities in DC. <laughs> you know, I, I wanted to dive into that a little bit too, because you mentioned Wyoming, Utah, Montana, um, <laughs> navigating those areas, which do have um, low minority populations. And especially when it comes to baseball, which is also low representation as well. Um, how are you able to navigate those, those circles and find success? Uh, yeah, my, my mom used to say that every you know she was the judge and she said everything she needed in the courtroom she learned raising children and again i think it's about relationships and it like like there was a point in dc where you know we could be on a date you could be the most beautiful girl i've ever seen if you tell me you're a republican i'm running out of the restroom you know what i mean you get but you get to a place where you know people don't really look well, people don't really you have to detract, detach people's politics or people's views on other things from the thing you're working on. Yeah. Like we, we have a shared interest in doing what's best for the Pioneer Baseball League. Yeah, We can leave it there. I, got, I almost got into a fight with one of the owners about the legacy of Ronald Reagan. I was like, dude, talk to me about ticket sales. That's what I'm here for. You know what I mean? And, and I think that, you know, growing out of that D.C. Mind, tribal mindset. Yeah. Now, now, to your specific question. My... My childhood was, was in some really low minority spaces. And I think that was a valuable lesson. I mean, I had friends in high school who literally had Confederate flags on the back of their truck. And there was nobody else I wanted to go shoot jump shots with after class than, than that dude, because he made all of them and I wanted to be like him. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, and then you go to politics. I was at the intersection of the Obama administration and the Con Congressional Black Caucus. Like, couldn't have been a less white space. You know what I mean? Like, I don't actually didn't have a, a, a Caucasian colleague the entire time I was lobbying. We had a couple Latino, but all black firm, whatever, whatever. So when I get here, and I walk into my first board meeting and I'm not only the only black person in the room, I'm the only person under 50 in the room. Yeah. I'm the only person uh, that lives on the East Coast in the room. You know, I'm, I'm the only person that, that I like that hasn't been in baseball for 25 years in the room. And, and so you just have to be comfortable. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm, I was intimidated in the abstract. And then you meet these people, you're like, they're just, they're just dudes and women. Like, I mean, they're not, they're not, you know, and, and that was kind of politics too. Like you could, you know, oh, John Kerry is a big deal. And then you sit and have a beer with him. Like, 
he wants to tell you about his daughter's softball game yeah. like any other normal person you know what i mean and you can't sit there scared of who they are yeah um i was also by far the only person in the room without a million dollars in the bank so there's a lot of a lot of kind of you know fish out of water situations but but at the end of the day people are just people and you know again like i said the last dude you know, I, I do meetings with the club, East, the clubhouse, the guys that clean the locker rooms, and I treat it just like the board meetings. And they're like, dude, you're the first person that got us together and care what we thought. And then they start telling me stuff that the board is like, oh, my God, how'd you find that out? We need to implement that immediately. Like, I can't believe that we didn't know this. And I'm like, I got it from the guy that you walk by every day without speaking to. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so, yeah, I, I think part of that is growing up in a small town. And, and I'll admit, I got lost in the D.C. ego stuff and had to kind of find myself again. You know what I mean? It's, it's really... I was in and out of the West Wing weekly. I was hanging out with the head of the Georgetown Sports Management for over F daily. You know what I mean? Like you can get an ego. Yeah. And and so it was refreshing to me to, you know, to to put my feet back on the ground and kind of do something where you can find the com- commonality. You know, sports is a great unifier. You know what I mean, like I'm doing two Taiwanese visas when I get off this call. Like it's you can't be, you know, the fan base might be all white up there. But the guys on the field earned it white, black, green, blue, purple. So people are people. No, no, I know. I definitely appreciate that. Um, you have talked briefly about building a team. You have recruited at Syracuse. We've we've been fortunate to get one of our own, Tate Jordan, to join your your team as well. Um what do you look for when building a team, especially when you're implementing new systems? Um my new thing is I look for former athletes. And I say that because I hired a kid that dropped out of junior college in Texas to go play for San Francisco Giants, got hurt, didn't work out, played in our league. Uh, he was a right fielder. And he was more reliable than the guy I hired from Georgetown Law School and more reliable than the guy I hired from the Syracuse Master Program. And the reason is because for the last 20 years of his life, he was playing right field. When the ball goes to first base, you better be there to back it up. Every time, in case it goes to the first baseman leg, 99 times out of 100, first baseman will catch the ball. That one time you're not standing behind him could cost you a run coming around third. And so this dude, if I asked uh, Aaron to do something, I never had to think about it again. It was going to be done. It was going to be done on time. It's going to be done, you know, not perfectly, but to the best of his efforts. You know what I mean? These other folks, I'm like, hey, that thing I asked you last week, oh, I forgot, and this, that, and the other. So I found that reliability is a big thing. And, and so I look for people that come recommended by folks that have seen their work. Yeah. Like I said before, you have to be enthusiastic. You have to want to be there. If you're only going to do the things I ask you to do. Yeah. Yeah. I'm good. It's not going to work. Yeah. It's not going to work. You know, I like the, the intern or the staff member who calls me and says, yo, it's got a great idea. And, and there's no ego involved, you know, Two out of five times, I'm going to say, that's a horrible idea. Call me again when you have a good one. Three out of five times, I'm going to go walk in board meeting and say, Matthias came up with this. You know what I mean? And so, so enthusiasm matters. Reliability matters. Um, you know, I think the two big questions that everybody's asking when they hire, whether they tell you or not, is can they do the work? And candidly, this is, my, like, this is a children's game. Like this, this is academically, almost everybody can do the work. Like, you know, I was negotiating people getting out of Gitmo in my past life. Like, this is fun. So, but then the, the second question, do I want to be around you every day? Yeah. And, and you know, I think I haven't been on y'all's side of the table where I, I want to tell them how much I know and I want to tell them, you know, who I know and, and where I've been. Like, nah, dude, like, if I'm going to look at your face all day, every day, are you pleasant? Are you humble? Are you slightly funny? You know what I mean? Are you going to be a tight ass who makes me stressed out more than I need to be? You know what I mean? Are you going to be the ego and the bad energy on the call who's saying, why do we have to do this? You know what I mean? So, so there's a real sort of, you know, it's a relationship. Do I want to be around you all day? And, and, and it's not like, oh, you're, you're a pleasant or a cool person or you're not. It, that's something you can actively do. And, and, and I think it matters a lot. You know, just, being humble, being hardworking, uh, not knowing when to interject and when to listen and, and making sure that when somebody asks you to do something, you communicate. It's perfectly fine to say, yo, I don't know how to do that. I don't have time to do that. But don't say yes. Yeah. 
and then show up the without the work. You know what I mean? Like I, I tell everybody, like, tell me right now if I actually do something reasonable. And, and you know, you, you, it's natural to be shy. You don't want to tell your supervisor, oh, I don't know how to do this, or oh, I don't have time to do this, or oh, you know, my wife's got a doctor's appointment tomorrow. It's like, but you got to communicate. You got to communicate. So. All right. Good, good segue for us to transition in, into mentors. Um, mentorship has been a, a major pillar of, of my career success, of my enjoyment in this career path. Um, can you describe your experience with mentors, especially for how diverse your background is with the politics, the the origins of of, the, of reemerging the modern day DC baseball scene, um, and of course this entrepreneurial spirit of what you're doing now, um, the value of mentors. Critical. Um, but I'm, I'm gonna give you a, a. It's not a pessimistic perspective, but it's a different perspective. So. It's right that any one person with a real relationship can change your life. And you can, and you, what I realized is that it's always more valuable to learn life from a mentor than to learn a job or a career or an industry from a mentor. You know, because if you start connecting with someone on those existential levels, you know, family, your hopes, your fears, blah, 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 money and jobs and stuff work yourself out. And those people will give you a ton of wisdom that you weren't even looking for. The flip side is that I've had people who I thought had my back and didn't. And you have to be able, it's like a quarterback, you have to have amnesia. You have to be able to say, I'm not going to be jaded. I'm not going to never trust somebody again. I'm going to open my heart up to trust the next person. And if, if they leave me high and dry, I'll go find somebody else. And eventually it'll work out. You know what I mean? So in this case, you know, to finish that thought, the flip side is be the mentor you wish you had. You know what I mean? So take the time and, and, and you're never, there's somebody right now that wants to go to NYU and be in the Tisch program. Go find that person and help them get there. Like you're never too far down the totem pole to reach back and help somebody else up. Um, you know, and, and then I'd say the, you know, just, just my personal experience. So the guy I worked for for the Nationals in 2006, yeah. uh, he ended up leaving the Nationals 09, goes back to California, uh, he was out of baseball for a while, did some stuff in golf, whatever. Every single time I was in San Francisco, I went over to his house, slept on his couch, you know what I mean, and just talked about life. You know, he had a triple bypass one time, this close to being dead from a heart attack. You know, I'm calling him every day in the hospital. How are you doing, Mike? Blah, 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 because I cared about him as a person. Then he pops up president of Pioneer League, and there's no conversation to be had. He called me, called me the day after. and was like, what's up? We doing this? You know what I mean? So, like, with, I'd say with mentors, with anybody else, you, you know, you invest in the person. And you hope it comes back, but you you keep the karma even if it doesn't. So that's what I would say about that. No, no, no. I, that, that was that was really good. Really, really, really good tie into your career path as well. Um, with the what what is your outlook like transitioning back to minor league baseball and pioneer baseball league? Um, what is your outlook on minor league baseball through all the changes in the industry? The outlook. Um, um, you mentioned earlier about the the um, relegation uh, stigma, and so um, how how did how do they categorize that? How do they build for that for the future? Um, what's your outlook in minor league baseball going forward? So Rob Manford has what he calls a one baseball philosophy. Yeah, and what that basically means is that he wants to be the Vladimir Putin of baseball. He That's wants right. to control every aspect of everything, and so. With the minor leagues, they went from six affiliated clubs per team to four. And what they basically did was take player salaries and player development off of their books, put it on ours, but keep us under their umbrella so they could still, you know, you know, players. If I had to bet, they're going to contract even further. And one of the reasons they're, one of the ways they're contracting right now is they just released these crazy new facility standards that say you got to have 30, you know, luxury boxes or you got to have, you know, all this stuff that minor league baseball teams can't have. And so some of the clubs are going to find $5 million to upgrade their stuff. Most of the clubs are going to say, if you need to kick me out of minor league baseball, kick me out of minor league baseball, because you would bankrupt me for trying to have the ribbon boards that you want, you know, 360 degree you know, visual displays in the middle of Iowa somewhere. You know, so my prediction, and this is kind of how we've been operating our league, is that we want to be a really well-run, you know, as an operation, as the governance, as the brand, 
because they're going to be clubs everywhere from uh, we had a club up in Northwest Oregon. We had a club in Salem, Washington that are saying, you know, how can we be part of Pioneer League? Because this Northwest League is about to contract and go out of this. So our thing is we went from eight to 10 in my first year. We're going to be 12 next year teams. And we're mm -hmm. right now mapping out what, our, what we look like as a 16 or 20 team league because we expect there to be eight clubs that want to be part of what we're doing. Yeah. And so I'm laying out the deals now. I'm, I'm talking to our merchandise vendor and saying, price this as if they're 20 of us and not 12. <laughs> you know, I'm talking to our TV streaming rights deal and saying, you know, if you want to do a long-term deal with us, you need to see where we're going. You know, and so it's, it's, you know, like any industry, you, you, you leverage the speculation. But in terms of minor league baseball, they're going to contract and they're going to try to cut the lower level expenses off of the big league owners' books. Yeah. yeah. Wait to see who's who at a later point, which is kind of the natural ebb and flow of trying to sign 15 and 16 year olds. <laughs> you know, eventually you realize that's a crazy risk to be setting up. Yeah, but I, but I do have to be honest with you. I mean, looking back at your your past career, um, especially early days with the Nationals and then political career in D.C. strategy, and then, of course, this role seems to combine all of it into, into a job that gives you the freedom to be able to um, really, really expand and really take risk. I mean, um, I know you didn't see this when you first took on the role, but but has it been a pleasant surprise to see how prepared you were for these kind of situations, knowing your background? And it's funny because it, you know, I don't think I was prepared to do this role. I think I was prepared to figure this out. Yeah. No, it's like if you take a job that you feel prepared for on day one, you didn't reach high enough. Yeah. Like I had a lot of WTF moments. And and you and that's where mentors come in. You know, I, I call my guy at the PGA tour and say, "What do you know about X?" And I call Dr. Kelly and say, "I need somebody that knows why." You know what I mean? Um, but you know, I learned a lot about relationships and politics, and managing our board is more like that than practicing law or running a sport organization. Hmm. You know what I mean? I learned a lot about um. You know, startups from my role with that with the consulting company, and and kind of you know being prepared to be asked to get the mail one day, and being <laughs> asked to negotiate an international treaty for hostage release the next. Yeah, and and you got to be able to do them both with the exact same enthusiasm. Yeah. So, I mean, um, I think I I one of the things I've learned is not to put all your eggs in one basket. Yeah. Because you you know that leaves you really vulnerable. Um, whether it's a, you know sports ownerships. Everybody that works in sports will tell you about the myth of Sisyphus. And if you haven't read it, it's Greek philosophy and it's great. There's a dude that pushed a boulder all the way up a hill. And every time he got right to the top, he rolled all the way back down. And that's exactly what sports and politics are like. You know what I mean? One day you're the president. The next day, there's no market for knowing you. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, sports too. You know, you're a day away from a new ownership group saying, my nephew's going to get this job and my friend's son going to get this job. And, and so you have to... Like I said, you have to have an urgency to put points on the board. And so I, I went from, I'm going to hide behind my desk and do the internal operations organization to saying, I'm going to take, I hate public speaking, but I, I took risk and put myself out there as the face of the league in different ways so that I have these independent relationships with people in the gaming space and people in the broadcasting space and all this stuff. And I like to say, I'm kind of incubating my next opportunity here. Um, you know, if you're not thinking about the exit, you're sitting around, you know, vulnerable as hell, waiting to get struck by lightning. Um, so, again, I you also you know, have humility. There's the, I, I went and just studied. So I, I you know, took a class on the visa application process because, you know, I I didn't want to sit here and lie to people and oh, I'm a lawyer, I must know this stuff. No, no, I don't know. I don't know anything about that. And and, and you got to have the desire to go learn. You got to be intellectually curious. And you know, my favorite parts of my job are the stuff that I have exact as literally no professional expertise or experience in, you know, like, but I can tell you what a, what a good looking sweatpant is. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I can tell you what an entertaining TV show is. And, and it's almost great to not know the ins and outs of production and, and broadcast when you just say to yourself, I'm on my couch, would I watch this? You know what I mean? And, and, and so whatever you think you're not prepared for, 
you got that life experience somewhere else. That's what, like, the guy I'm talking about, the player that, that dropped out of junior college, when he stopped playing, his first question was, Henry, should I go back to school? Like, all these other people have degrees, and I don't. And I'm like, dude, they're trying to learn what you just lived. You know what I mean? Like, we're in a classroom because, like Yoel said, we stopped growing. You know what I mean? And, and this dude has signed 10 of the contracts that I'm studying. Like, don't tell me that you're not prepared to go and do, you know, like, and so you kind of just have to switch everybody's mentality. Like, like stop dwelling on what you don't have or what you don't know and, and, and apply what you do know. I mean, like I said, I, I learned the personalities of this in middle school. So. Yeah. Okay. And then we're coming up on the, the end of our session. And so I did, I did want to, um, a parting words of, an understanding of how to navigate this kind of career path. And, and of course, you know, tying the bow on pulling all of your, your past experiences, but more importantly, um, putting it together to where you see the future going for, for, for you and for, and for the Pioneer Baseball League. So for context, I also teach sports management at Georgetown. And so I spent a lot of time talking to people like yourselves and the ultimate catch 22 is always that you can't get a gig without experience. You can't get experience without a gig. <laughs> yeah. Put my email in the chat. When you email me, tell me that Dr. Kelly had you on this panel or, or whatever thing. And I promise you, I'm going to treat you like your Dr. Kelly. Uh, you got to find the people that are willing to ride for you and you got to put yourself out there. You know what I mean? I always say that getting a no leaves you exactly where you would have been if you didn't ask. You know I mean, so so having the confidence and the resilience to say, I'm gonna shoot the shot with Miami Heat, and if it if it doesn't win, I learn something from the process. I'm gonna keep it moving. You know I mean, like there, it'll be easy to, to decide that you don't have the relationships, you don't have the network, or you don't have the pedigree. Like burn through all of that and find the person that believes in you, and it won't matter. So lesson one is networking, and like I said, it's not networking; it's relationship. Yeah. If, you, if it's obvious that what you want from me is a job, I'll help you get a job and I'll leave it there. Yeah. If you said help me figure out a career, that's a much more interesting conversation. Uh, so relationships, flexibility. You know, my plan was to be general counsel of Washington Wizards, and this is where I ended up. And I couldn't be happier. But if you had told me that I was going to play basketball for 25 years and then go talk about baseball all day every day, I would have laughed at you. I mean, so, so flexibility, relationships. Um, I'm going to give you all a book to read, too. A guy named Andy Dulwich, who basically wrote the book on sports marketing, worked for the Giants, San Francisco Giants, the Oakland A's, the 49ers, like, worked for everybody. He took the Memphis Grizzlies from Vancouver to Memphis, uh, worked for the Warriors after that. Long story short, he wrote this book called Loss of Logo, LOL, Loss of Logo. And it's a fascinating book about how all of us in sports wrap our identity around the team we're with. You know, he, he joked that his brother is a doctor, his other brother is like a, a lawyer or something. And he was the guy that worked for the uh, Warriors. So every time they were Thanksgiving, people came to him first. Like, what's going on in your life, Andy? You know, I mean? he loses a job. And he's the last one to speak at Thanksgiving. You know what I mean? But, and, and it's real easy. I mean, I, I literally wear free merch every day. It's really easy to wrap your personality and identity around a sports gig. And how do you maintain your sense of self when that's suddenly taken from you? Yeah. You know I mean? So you got to be a person who does this and not have this become all of who you are or you'll get lost in it. No, no, that, that's, that's fantastic advice. And um, it really ties the bow on all of the, the, the nuggets of wisdom you've given throughout this session. Um, for everyone else out there, please, please join me in thanking uh, Henry Hunter for joining us. Um, formerly, of course, of the Washington uh, Nationals, former 10-year career in D.C. politics, and of course, the current um, Executive Vice President of the Pioneer Baseball League. Henry, thank you for joining us today for our Black History Month Fireside Chat. All right. uh, the pleasure is mine. Giovanni, Jason, Jonathan, hit me up whenever you want about anything. Like I said, I'll tell you if I can't help you, and I'll help you if I can. All right, that works. Thank you, Henry. <laughs>